Oh, and welcome back to The Give and Go. I'm your co-host, Reynoso, and I'm here with my boy. Soltero. What's up, guys? Is this one of the best slates of quarterfinal Champions League matches we've seen in recent memory? I think so. I mean, when you look at it, there's parity in pretty much every single game. Really excited to break it down, man. I want to know what you have to say. I want to know what the people have to say about these ties. But I really do think the reason why I think a lot of people are excited is because all four matches are pretty even. If you really look at it. All of them with some of the biggest clubs involved. I think it's going to make for incredible scenes and atmospheres here in these beautiful European nights. And so there's one matchup that we must start with, the the star-studded matchup, the headline matchup here that so many people are already debating and arguing about. Yeah, it's imagine. Real Madrid versus Manchester City. And first off, I want to start with this. We have a lot of new viewers to this show. The Asian Cup gave us a lot of uh, mm. uh, viewers from a lot of different places in the world, and we've just grown a lot in the past year. Last year was the first time that we actually covered the UEFA Champions League. And what's funny is that this same matchup happened 365 days ago and we covered and predicted what would happen in this match. I want to play the clip of what was said last year so that people can kind of get a okay. get some context going into the conversation we're about to have yeah. about where we stood, and more specifically, where you, Saltero, stood on the Real Madrid-Manchester City matchup. For me, it's not a question of who wins this game. It's a question of how badly does Manchester City <laughs> beat Real Madrid, bro. I don't care how hot of a take it is or how aggressive it sounds or maybe low-key how disrespectful it is because look i understand madrid know one thing and that's how to win in the uefa champions league i think finally there is a team that i have my absolute trust and faith in to topple that notion and that is manchester city probably the best team in form right now in all of europe definitely all of the world i will write up a 10 page apology (laughs) to do live on this podcast because I, i i truly truly We'll be surprised if Manchester City lose to Real Madrid. I'm being as open as I can about this. I only see City in the final. I love that. And that's me. And there you have it. What followed was Real Madrid getting trashed, getting Mm. destroyed by this Manchester City side. 5-1 on aggregate. Manchester City then going on to the final and winning the tournament for the first time in their history. And so the way I want to set up this conversation is, do you stand by the same things you said an entire year ago in which you went as far as saying that you would write a 10-page apology (laughs) letter if Real Madrid found a way to win this matchup. Do you see the same thing happening here once again with Manchester City facing off against Real Madrid? Not the same thing, but I have the same ultimate outcome. Manchester City beating Real Madrid, this time in the quarterfinals, going to the semifinals. And... My analysis is very similar, though. I don't think the aggregate will be as wide as it was last year. But when I look at both Manchester City and Madrid this year and last year, what really stands out is the narrative, the progress, the journey that each team is on. I'll start with Madrid. Last year was a really weird year for Madrid. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of old players really weren't sure who was going to leave, who was going to stay. And then there was a lot of youth. And a lot of that youth was just getting transitioned into the team. This year, it's a lot more definitive as to who plays where, which player is really effective in what position. And I think Ancelotti has a lot more, has a lot better of an identity with this specific Real Madrid squad. Problem is, I still think they're figuring out all the nooks and crannies of this team. They're very elite. There's a lot of talent in this side. But when you look at their opponent in Manchester City, a team that was fully realized last year, yes, they're not as good this year, but they're still playing peak football. They're still playing at an elite level, vying for a very tight title in England. And when I just look at the two teams and what journey they're on right now, I still think Madrid can be better. I still think it can be a lot better. Whereas Manchester City, they can be better, but you know the margin to that ceiling is a lot smaller mm-hmm. than it is for Madrid. Mm-hmm. So honestly, full respect to Madrid, because in my opinion, they've improved drastically over the last 12 months. They're about, hopefully, to win the La Liga title this year. So that's great for Real Madrid. But I think right now, still, 
Manchester City are the better squad, the better team, which is why I have them moving forward in the UEFA Champions League. Yeah, Matt, Madrid right now with only two losses this season, both of them coming at the hands of your beautiful Atleti side. Manchester City, four losses this season, but all happening very early on in the season. I think it's been almost like three months since they last mm. saw themselves lose a match. They faced off against Top Town, the Prem, Top Town, the Champions League, and they've proven themselves time and time again. And I agree, Madrid has really improved to, yeah. honestly, a really good point to where it's actually really, really really competitive this matchup is very competitive going in whereas you know coming off of that defeat last year I, I would have thought it would have been difficult for them to recover and reach that Man City type of level that type of height yeah. the one factor I want to talk about when it comes to Madrid and the biggest difference between last year's Madrid and this year's is the presence of Jude Bellingham. Yes. What impact yes. does a player like him have on this overall matchup? Because, I mean, bro, he's been one of the best players in world football this entire season. And if anything, he could become the answer. He could become the Lisa Al Gaib <laughs> to Real Madrid potentially putting off a Champions League victory here. Yeah, and that's why I have this tie being way closer than last year because of Jude Bellingham. Beyond all the chemistry that they built this season, which has been fantastic, it has been Jude Bellingham as to why Madrid have been so ruthless in front of goal. When he joins Vinicius and Rodrigo in the box, anything can happen, truly. At least once in the game, Bellingham will get in the box and he will create a chance either for himself or for his teammates, and he's able to do it against anybody. He's ridiculously good on the ball. His ball manipulation is one of the best in the world, and you pair that alongside a very informed Vinicius Jr. who's been fantastic for Real Madrid for the last two years, Madrid will cause Manchester City problems. A City team that honestly has been leaking, by their standards, a decent amount of goals this season. So I think Madrid honestly can back themselves to keep this game tight, to attack Manchester City with a lot of confidence. And then, of course, you still have other really informed players like Federico Valverde. Rodrigo's been, I think, Rodrigo's been in very good form as well. And then, of course, you still have veterans like Tony Cruz dominating the midfield as well. So I think this game is going to be very, very tight. But they're playing Manchester City, bro. And you know, let, let, let's just go in. I'm going to go right go in. into it right now. I, I still think Manchester City is top two team in the world right now, even though they're not as good, they're not as, good as they were last year. And I, I'm going to look at the game that they played a couple weeks ago against Liverpool. They were second best, definitively second best. They still somehow, with a little bit of luck, did not lose the game. That was over 90 minutes. Madrid had to face that over 180 mm -hmm. minutes. Mm -hmm. This team definitely has its weaknesses, way more so than last year. Jack Grealish is not in form whatsoever. They've had to replace that with Jeremy Doku. I still think Doku hasn't really found himself in this Manchester City team fully, not the way that Jack Grealish did when he was in his prime last year. Holland's been maybe not as involved. De Bruyne has been injured, but you have you know the inclusion of Phil Foden, who's just gone off this season. But I think more so, again, I go back to that progress idea. Pep has this team drilled. Yeah. More so than anything else, Manchester City know exactly where to be on the pitch against anybody. And over a course of two legs, I have to back that. They're still playing at an elite level, even though they're, you know, quote unquote, worse this season. And I just think it takes a lot, a lot to beat Manchester City. Madrid have the qualities, but I just don't know over two legs. Yeah, over two legs, that, that really does seem like quite the feat there. Yeah. Even on the tactical sense, I do think Pep Guardiola has that edge over Carlo Ancelotti yeah. when it comes to adjusting, adapting. Over 180 minutes, it's going to take damn near a perfect performance for Real Madrid to pull off a victory like that. And ultimately, man, I don't see it happening. I'll be joining you right there. I will be on Manchester City's side throughout this entire matchup because I'm with you. I'm actually feeling fairly confident in that this Manchester City side will be able to take upon themselves the responsibility of bringing down such a strong, such a yeah. historic team in the Champions League in back-to-back -back years. If there's one team that can do it, bro, it's this Man City dynasty led by one of the greatest, if not the greatest coach of all time. And they've actually had the luck as well this entire season of not having to deal with a lot of injuries. Yeah. Whereas that has been a narrative for Real Madrid. Vinny was out for the first half of the year. Thibaut Courtois might come back into this matchup. We don't know yet, depending on his health. And then you have Eder Militao, who's also been out as well. Well, potentially coming back into this matchup. David Alaba has been out for, ruled out for the rest of the season yeah, yeah. with an injury. True, it's been, he's playing center back. He's playing yeah. center back, man. Nacho's having to step in into that center back position, which he is good. He is formidable in, but he's not the ideal candidate for that position. Over 180 minutes against his Manchester City side, 
I don't see it happening, man. I just don't. And, and for that reason, I ask you this question. Sure, they won't dominate the way they did last year. That's what we're predicting here. They won't win 5-1 on aggregate. Yeah, but yeah, if they yeah. end up winning by a slightly smaller margin, does that mean then that your apology letter will be just a little bit smaller? Let's do let's let's negotiate a five-page apology letter five. if Real Madrid wins. I'll write no, half no, no, I'll write no, half no, of no, it. No, 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 no. I'll write half There'll of it. There'll be no apology because I'm actually giving Madrid complete credit here. <laughs> they had zero chance last year. Zero. And it's crazy the amount of people that thought otherwise. Yeah, that, that, this year, you know, I'll give him, I'll give him a double-digit percent chance. I might give Where him ten percent. Ten? Yeah, maybe. You don't want to go up to twenty? I could go up to twenty. Okay. I could definitely maybe go up 20. to twenty. I okay. can go, I can go up there because again, this Madrid team is way more in form and way more realized than last year. I just think that they can be a lot better. And Manchester City's, yeah. which is, you know, I mean, they're at their peak, slightly less than. But you know what would be crazy? When Real Madrid do lose to Manchester City. That's going to be back to back. Yeah. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Like, the back to back, biggest team in Europe over the last 10 years, losing to the same team. Oh, dude, as an Atleti fan, I want that nothing. <laughs> I, I want that so badly to happen, bro. Because ah, they will low key man. have their number at that point. I do think the fact that this will be their third year in a row facing off against each other yeah. makes this for already one of the better Champions League rivalries that we've seen in the knockout stages, man. Like, I love it. I love that the fact that they got drawn into this in the quarterfinals because it's just, I need to see this matchup. I need to, to determine who is a better team. I also do believe that whoever wins this matchup will go on to win the trophy. No disrespect to Atleti. But I do believe that the winner will come out of this matchup 100%. Real Madrid beats Man City, bro. Imagine the momentum that gives him. Imagine oh the confidence. God, yeah. Like oh, yeah. Everyone else will not be able to live up to the competitive level of Manchester City. And if Manchester City wins this matchup, then you're just taking down the one team that I think is posing the biggest threat throughout this entire tournament. There's still Bayern Munich. There's Arsenal. But I just think in recent years, they haven't been at the same level as Manchester City or Real Madrid. So I think the implications of this matchup is absolutely huge as well as the cultural impl implications which you pointed out of man what does it say about Real Madrid if they end up losing back-to-back -back years to Manchester City yeah and City have a crazy narrative too because if they can down Madrid back-to-back -back, then they'll low-key be having the same narrative going on in England trying to win for the first time ever in Premier League history a fourth title against pretty much the same rivals Liverpool and Arsenal so good lord City's you know, City has like a trail of fire right now that yeah. they're trying to blaze through it's Kind of crazy. Does um, oh, when I look at this Manchester City eleven, I try to go through it and predict who would start. There's only two positions that I'm curious as to who would start. Mm -hmm. Obviously, up top you have Erling Holland, and then behind him you have De Bruyne, you have Bernardo Silva, Phil Foden. Those three for sure. But that left wing position, will it be Grealish? Will it be Jeremy Doku? Or is there someone else, Julian Alvarez, perhaps getting in? Yeah, I see Doku or Alvarez. Alvarez low key lately has been coming off the bench. I think Pep will start Doku. But yeah, I just don't see Grealish starting for sure. Yeah, I, I just don't. Un unless over the next like three weeks, he somehow finds his form. But yeah, and then the defensive midfield pivot I do see being Rodri and Stones, and then behind them it's also a question of right now I have Nathan Ake, Ruben Diaz, and Kyle Walker. But does Akanji find a way into the lineup instead? Is yeah, that'll be really interesting. Does Pep slightly go with a more ball-oriented player like Gavardiol, or does he go with Akanji as you said? I think lately, especially all season, this calendar year, he's been going with Akanji. So I think he'll just stick to that. But I mean... He I'll, benched uh, Diaz for the Liverpool game. It did, yeah. he did. But that, that had kind of... That had been happening this mm -hmm. season. He's been benching Diaz a decent amount. So that, that didn't really fully surprise me here. But yeah, I, I bet he'll go with Akanji. Yeah. Unless he really wants to change it up against Madrid. I don't see why he would. Yeah, from Madrid starting 11, Vinny Jr., Rodrigo up top, Bellingham right behind them. Then Kroos and Valverde. I think Chua Mini will be in a... I, I think, I assume that he won't be playing a center back position here with Nacho and Rudiger being the center backs. But for me, with Real Madrid, the question is the injuries. Does Eder Militao find a way back into the lineup after going almost the entire not playing football? Can he just step into a quarterfinal matchup against Manchester City like that. And Thibaut Courtois, how healthy is yeah. he? Because he is back in training, and he is such a class goalkeeper. But, I don't know, mentally getting into the rhythm of the game to get put into a match like that, it's such, the stakes are so big. I wonder if Ancelotti will be willing to take the risk of, you know, benching Lunin, who has actually been really solid in his uh, tenure here, um, for Courtois, who, I mean, damn near won the trophy for Real Madrid a couple years ago against Liverpool. Yeah, and I, I really do wonder if going into this April fixture, 
if there really is no other center back option other than Rudiger, Chuameni, and Nacho, will Ancelotti actually opt to purposefully do Chuameni in the center back position and try and open up the midfield and starting Camavinga instead? It's mm. worked albeit against weaker teams in La Liga, but it when it has worked, it, it, it's been brilliant. Yeah. Because Camavinga is so good at ball movement and ball distribu- distribution. Low key, maybe even better than Chuameni right now, like right now. So I think if Ancelotti wants to play a little bit more fluid of a midfield, he would do it. But is he going to be scared of Manchester City's offensive threat? If he is, then I could see him tightening up the midfield defensively by not playing Camavinga and then also putting Nacho in the center back position. Yeah. I could see that. It's yeah. just going to, we're going to really see how Ancelotti feels in this first leg by the lineup. Yeah. I will say, Chomini, I think, has been good. He's been great. He's been good. Like, they haven't yeah. lost. So, like, he hasn't been a weak link by that no. sense. So, I think that's been. Honestly, really incredible. A great development for him. We knew he was great defensively, but to showcase himself in this manner, uh, if you're a Real Madrid fan, just yet another player that is so versatile, so good, (laughs) and so young, that's a great player to have. Next matchup. Let's go. Next matchup that I have listed down is Arsenal facing off against Bayern Munich. What was your reaction, man? Just when you saw the draw, when you saw the results, and you saw that Arsenal is slated to face off against Germany's finest in a massive, massive Quarterfinal matchup for Arsenal, one of the biggest games, not the biggest game for them in the past 10 plus years, man. This is my favorite fixture out of all the four. Obviously, bias for Atletico, and that, that'll be the one where I either cry or, you know, <laughs> leap in excitement. But as far as an unbiased point of view, this is definitively my favorite fixture. And it's just because the offense that both of these teams possess might be, when it's in its most open, the best in Europe for either side. Arsenal, you have Manchester City, Liverpool in the league, but this season, Arsenal, when they're on it, low-key play the sexiest offensive-style mm. football in England. And I, I I don't even want to have any arguments for that. Liverpool and Manchester City have been really good mm. offensively this year, but Arsenal, man, my goodness, the way they attack. It's brilliant to watch when they're on it. And for Bayern Munich... They have they average right now in the Bundesliga three goals a game. Three burgers. Three. Damn. It's re- they have 70, 78 goals in twenty six matches. Good Literally Lord. three on the dot. Yeah. It's ridiculous. And this calendar year specifically, the goals have really opened up for Bayern Munich. But I just think this game is going to be so different than the matches that both Arsenal and Bayern previously had in the round of sixteen because. Both Bayern and Arsenal are just going to go at each other. I think this is going to be probably the most open game. It's going to be end-to-end because Bayern and Arsenal are both at their individual best when it's just full-on offense. So I'm really excited to see how this game pans out. They have to outscore one or the other. And uh, yeah, I'm just really excited just purely for the offense that's going to be on display the this match. The offense and the stage, man. The first game is going to be at the Emirates. So Arsenal will open this matchup hosting it. Second game will be at the Allianz Arena. I do think that plays a big factor as well. For sure. Mikel Arteta facing off against Thomas Tuchel in this head coaching matchup. And I mean, the names on paper are ridiculous. You have yeah, Bukayo Saka, Declan Rice, Martin Odegaard, Harry Kane, Leroy Sané, Musiala, Davies, Kimmich, Martinelli, Gabriel Saliba, Komen, Kim Min Jae, yeah. and Upamecano. This... This is going to be an incredible matchup. It's going to be incredible. And I'm already starting. I've been talking to Arsenal fans, whether it's through Instagram DMs or in person. And man, the nerves, man. The <sighs> nerves for this matchup. Because going into this, I do I do feel that that historic weight, especially for Arsenal fans. Byron has been here time and time again for the past 20 fucking years, man. But for Arsenal, they've been trying to make a name for themselves once again, that matches the heights that they reached in those early 2000s with guys like Thierry Henry, leading them on deep Champions League runs. And now this is the first team that's been able to do it in so, so long. And they're leading the Premier League at the same yes, damn yeah, time. Yep. It's a magical time right now in London. But I do think that the nervousness does come from just this machine-like approach that Byron has to this tournament. And more than anything, is it the fact that in this matchup, Is Arsenal the favorite to win it? That's what I love about this matchup too. Besides the technical quality on the pitch, the external narratives are so intriguing. Arsenal, when you look at this team, it's the first time they reached the quarterfinals since 2010. Do you know how long that is? It's been so long. When you look at all other seven teams in the quarterfinals, they've all reached the quarterfinals more recently than top of the Premier League table Arsenal right now, which is pretty ridiculous. So you look at the top eight, Arsenal have the least experience, and low-key, I would build them as the underdog 
in all of the round in all of the quarterfinals for the UEFA Champions League. It makes it that much more exciting because they have such talent going forward. Yeah. They might be able to fulfill a crazy narrative oh, yeah. by beating European giants Bayern Munich and booking themselves a ticket to the semifinal and their first time making the quarterfinals in over 12 years. That's a ridiculous narrative. And, and beyond that, when you look at the starting 11 that Mikel Arteta puts out, there's no winners. <laughs> N- none yeah. of them have really won a title yeah. except for Jorginho. Wow. He is yeah. the only one. And Declan Rice won a conference league last year with West Ham. <laughs> yes, yes, I'll sir. give him that. Probably. I'll definitely give him that. But beyond that, bro, I mean, Raya was with Brentford last year. Yeah. You know? Kivior, Gabriel, Saliba. Dude, these guys just hit the scene last year with Arsenal. Kai Havertz, too, as well. Like, it, it's kind of crazy. Oh, All of these yeah. guys are coming into form with Arsenal who have just reached the quarterfinal stage for the first time in a very long time. Hey, Zinchenko, give some respect. <laughs> okay, that's true, that's true. That's Zinchenko's the only one I can winner. think of him. He's a winner, he's a winner for sure. But I, I just love that these guys are fully inexperienced. Yeah. When you look at their opponents though, Bayern Munich, I mean, Harry Kane, Eric Donner, maybe they haven't won anything, but they they were just in Champions League final like what, four or five mm-hmm. years ago. You look at Thomas Muller, one of the, the, the definition Almighty. of a veteran in modern football. Yeah. He's seen it literally all, and he's also won it all. And then you have guys like Joshua Kimi, Leon Goreska, who just won it with Bayern Munich a couple years ago. You can say the same veteran uh, thing about Manuel Neuer as well. Davies? Da- yeah, won Alfonso it? Davies, yeah. A- absolutely. Kim Min Jae won uh, the Serie A with Napoli. Bayern Munich for as weird as they've been this season, still have a crop of players that are used to winning big matches. That's why I'm excited about this match because you just have two completely opposite teams narratively. And that's why my next question is, who deserves to go through? Based off the season that we've seen, right? Arsenal leading the toughest league in the entire world and playing some sexy football mm. when they're at it, Ending games by the 20th, 30th minute versus Bayern, who is having one of the worst seasons in their history. Clearly in second place to a Bayer Leverkusen side who is absolutely killing the Bundesliga right now. <laughs> Bayern, who won 10 straight Bundesliga, an entire decade of victories, now set to not lift the trophy for the first time in a very long time, but still finding a way to take care of business in the Champions League regardless. Who deserves it more, man? Who deserves it more between these two teams? Because there is the history factor. There is the star factor. But when it comes to who's earned it, who's earned that semifinal spot, yeah. I think there's a clear answer. I think so. And it's it's the answer I'll give definitively as to who will go on. I have Arsenal winning this tie. I really do. Bayern Munich, all season long, where whereas they have been very good offensively in the big matches, talking about against Bayer Leverkusen, Loki, even Leipzig, and in, in the tricky ones against teams that show up against them in the Bundesliga, they can't figure it out. The games they used to grind and win by a goal margin, kind of like how Manchester City have been doing the last couple of years, those games Bayern Munich now lose or draw. They drop points. They don't win those games anymore. I see this match being pretty tight because there is a lot of offensive talent and Arsenal a little bit inexperienced. But in tight games, Bayern Munich have not proven themselves this year. They really haven't. And our Arsenal aren't going to be like Lazio and just completely give in to Bayern Munich's pressure. They won't. It'll get tight. Bayern Munich will have their moments. They'll have spells of possession where they're just onslaughting Arsenal's defense. But Arsenal will figure it out. They have insane amount of quality in the midfield and the offensive line. And Bayern Munich, for me, it's just that inconsistency defensively when games are tight. I can't trust that. Arsenal are still... I mean, Arsenal are top of the Premier League table right now in a very competitive league. Bayern Munich are 10 points off of Leverkusen. Yeah. So I, I have Arsenal winning this, not by a large margin, but I have them beating Bayern Munich. Damn, man. for me, it's on it's on a knife edge right now. Like it's so so close. It's I've gonna be close. Debated it in my mind so much, but I guess I'm joining you, my friend. Let's go. I'm joining Let's you. Go. I'm going Arsenal, but under the criteria that they do this in the first game, they have to kill Bayern. Mm. At home, uh, yeah. they have to kill them. Yeah. We saw what happened to Lazio getting a 1-0 victory. Tight, impressive for them for sure. Mm. But that's not enough against Bayern. Especially when no. you have to go play the second leg at the Allianz Arena. And Bayern has been known to be just a ruthless team when they're against it. Especially in the Champions League. Arsenal has to kill them. By that I mean at least a two-goal margin. And anything above that I think is an absolute win. And sets them on the right path to getting through to the semifinals. That's the first thing. And the second reason for why I don't trust this Bayern Munich side. On top of everything that you just mentioned. Which I think is very valid. Yeah. Is the presence of Diot Upamecano. 
I think I'm starting to get very, very concerned regarding his center back play in these big, big matches, man. He's had mistake after mistake after mistake in big games for both club, but then also at the international oh, yeah. level as well, man. Yeah. We've seen it. And I just don't think I have the trust with him as as what I do with Saliba, as what I do with Gabriel, yeah. and the pairing fullbacks as well. For me, that Upamecano situation just concerns me too much to be able to put my, to, to have a podcast where people watch what I say <laughs> and to put my trust on that. I can't do it with Juan man. I just can't. Not yet. If if he's able to pull off a really good center back performance in this matchup, then that might even that, that that'll actually convince me towards the other side of maybe starting to trust him a little bit more. But until I see it, man, I'm gonna bet against him, especially when the team going against you is a team that's as fiery, yeah. as deadly, and as active as Arsenal. A team that forces you to constantly make decisions defensively every 20 seconds, man, that they're on the ball. You have to be looking over your shoulder to see if there's any runs being made or if the player that you're defending doesn't pull off some crazy skill move because the talent of this Arsenal offensive line is ridiculous, yeah. man. It's yeah. ridiculous. So for that reason, man, I'm going Arsenal. And I, I think the only thing that could stop them is just that historical factor, is that experience, is that yeah. idea of them being here for the first time and actually seeing a really tight matchup happening and maybe not living up to that expectation or that pressure, the pressure being too much. That's what I can see stopping Arsenal in this matchup. But talent-wise, I think Arsenal is clearly the better team. I think so too. And just to comment on that Upa Meccano uh, take that you had, completely agree. And ultimately, I'm just kind of disappointed in how his career's turned out at Bayern because... When he was at Leipzig, he was very mistake prone as well, but he's so young. And I thought that going to Bayern from Leipzig, he would just show himself to be one of the best center backs in the world. But no, it's just who he is. <laughs> he's a very mistake prone center back, bro. It's actually kind of crazy considering when you look at all the other top teams in Europe, uh, you could probably say yeah. Upa is probably the worst center back out of all the top center backs at the top teams in Europe, which is, yeah, not good for Bayern. So much so that I think if Tuchel does this right, he should probably play Dyer or Kim Min Jae alongside um, De Ligt. Mm. Like I would, I just wouldn't even play Upa Meccano. And I'll be really curious to see what Tuchel does there, because yeah, Tuchel knows he's playing one of the best offenses in Europe, in the world, in Arsenal. He can't mess around here. And, and this is it for Tuchel, by the way. Th yeah, this is that's like, true. This is it. This is it. And if he can't get a result here, then he'll end his tenure at Bayern with a little bit of respect, honestly. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's a lot riding. There's a lot riding there's on lot, this man. game for there's both Arsenal and Bayern. But yeah, just to end it with your exact take as well, I, I just really highly rate Arsenal's offense with the midfield and their combination with their offensive line, Martinelli or Trossard, Jesus or Kai Havertz, and then Bukayo Saka, Martin Odegaard operating underneath that. Come on, man. Ooh, Come it's on. exciting. That's it's exciting, very bro. exciting. But I'll be really curious to see how this Arsenal team performs under the bright lights of Europe. Yeah. That's, yeah. This is really going to be an insane, insane testament to what this team is made of. What I love, though, is I think Arteta knows this, too. Mm -hmm. I tr if there's a manager right now to trust and lead a young team like Arsenal, I actually would trust Arteta fully. So I'm really curious to see what his team talks have been the last couple weeks, what it will be the week leading up to that first game in the Emirates. It's going to be nuts, man. I'm so excited for this tie. But yeah, just, I, I have Arsenal going through. And speaking of Arteta, coach that is is new to these experiences is trying to make a name mm -hmm. for himself but has a crazy crazy situation at his hand here against Bayern Munich let's think of the opposite a coach that is experienced a coach that no matter who he has on the pitch is able to shape up some incredible matches against some of the toughest teams in the world and has seen himself bring these sides to Champions League finals <laughs> the only thing missing in his resume is that final result that final that final game that final performance to put him over the edge but everything else has been absolutely masterful and the man that I am speaking about is your father <laughs> 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 Diego Simeone mm. Diego Simeone leading this Atletico Madrid side to another quarterfinal appearance after an insane insane matchup in the round of 16 Fuck. against the runners up of last year's tournament Inter Milan Atletico is now slated to face off against Borussia Dortmund the first game being at the Wanda the second one being in Dortmund we were talking about Arsenal and that being an exciting factor I can't imagine the excitement that you have that you're withholding with the potential of Atletico making it to another semifinal in the Champions League. Can you imagine that in this fucking season that they've had? Aye, aye, aye. And my first question to you is, before we even get to the predictions, is if Atleti wins this matchup, are you going to the Wanda? 
I'm going to the Metropolitano. I'm going to do everything I can in my power. I'll spend $20,000. <laughs> I don't care what it takes. If we get to the semifinal, I'm going to be there at the Metropolitano. And if I can't find my way in, I'll do whatever it yeah. takes, bro. Yeah, yeah. I will do whatever it yeah. takes. But, bro, ever since we've been into Milan, before the draw, I've been shaking. <laughs> Got the shakes. Get the shakes, bro. And I don't know if it's going to go away until <laughs> that fateful night in Spain against Dortmund. And I'll just, yeah, I'm just going to go right into it. I've been dreaming of Dortmund, man. I've been dreaming of Dortmund ever since we bit Inter Milan. It was just a quick little one a day and a half before the draw. Yeah. And I think uh, thousands of other Atleti fans have been dreaming the same thing. Here's what's crazy, though. I think Dortmund have been dreaming about Atletico, too. And that's what makes this matchup so interesting because I see this as 50-50. I think either team has the same amount of reasons to beat the other, and I think either reason is very probable to occur. So this matchup is just going to be so even, but for very different reasons. They have completely different styles. The way Atletico can win, though, is if we bully them. That's how we beat Inter Milan at the Metropolitano. We use the physicality of our midfield. Talking about players like Llorente, Rodrigo De Paul, Coque, Mario Hermoso, Savic, who like to go up and just put a body on any player that has the ball. That's how we're going to beat Dortmund. Nullify their fluidity in the midfield by bullying them physically. And here's the thing. It doesn't always work, right? And that's why Atletico have been not that great this season it's why we lost that first game against Inter Milan because they found a way against that brutality against that physicality if we can't touch the opponent's midfield we're stretched and I think unlike a lot of people think Atletico don't put on defensive masterclasses anymore that's not how we play instead we just create chaos in the midfield win the ball high up and then from there Griezmann can operate and what an operator uh, Morata can finish a chance Depay can come off the bench finish a chance individually right Lino can provide dribble penetration from the left hand side but we that only happens if we win our physical duels in the midfield if Dortmund find a way to pass around that midfield block, that's where they beat us. And that's where we're going to get beat if that does happen. It, it, it was just a little fortunate that, you know, Mkhitaryan, Barella, Chanoglu got beat by that in the second leg. They couldn't make more than three passes after like the first 15, 20 minutes. We won that physical duel. If Dortmund can avoid that, that's how they'll win this game. Because when we get stretched, bro, we get stretched, man. We really don't have good one-on-one -on -one defenders. We play a back five. And the thing is, we don't have wingers. So we need Lino and Molina to go way up high when we do have offensive possession. That's also where we get caught. Because our rotation is shit. <laughs> it's not that good, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we get beat off the pass... Yeah. We're going to get beat, man. And that, that's why I truly see this game as 50-50. That's what Barca did. Yeah, it's what... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Jesus. And there's also... <laughs> that's what Barca did in the... the Twice. I say our second weakness as well beyond if we don't win our physical duels, we get stretched. Our second weakness is sometimes we just don't show up. It's happened a lot this season. Yeah. Anybody can beat us if we do not show up. My only thinking here is that this is all we have left. You know, we're out of the Copa del Rey. We've been out of the title race in Spain since December, November, honestly. This is all we have left. We just proved we can beat one of the better teams in Europe by beating the Italian champions, Inter Milan, and former runners-up. We'll feel good about going against Dortmund, but my God, man, Dortmund have a lot of weapons too. That's a thing. Dortmund have a lot of weapons. They have a lot of quality in the midfield. They have good dribble, dribble penetration that could be provided from players like Jaden Sancho, Daniel Malin. There's a lot of good things about Dortmund, mm -hmm. and yeah, this is going to be a crazy, crazy even game. There's a lot of similarities, man. When you look at this Dortmund side and Atleti, man, I, I would consider Dortmund to be the German Atleti with how they're in fourth place right now. Yeah. They're also not playing for much in the league, but in the Champions League, this is it. This is all they have, and Terzic has done a great job with this team. Yeah. You know, we've, we criticized and we made fun, and all the jokes flew when they blew that lead to Bayern, but the truth is they were a point away from pulling off yeah. the incredible, mm -hmm. and that was thanks to Terzic and how he managed the team throughout the entire season. You have guys like uh, Niklas Fulkrik coming into this team, getting double-digit goals. Julian Brunt, I've mentioned before, as almost like a mini Martin Odegaard with his creativity yeah. and his decisive in the, decisiveness in the final third. It's really good. It's really impactful. Malin, Marco Royce with his experience and his constant pursuit, almost like uh, 
the fucking Lord of the Rings chasing that ring, bro. Like he's been chasing, chasing a, a, a victorious trophy here, man, for so many years. Yeah. Maybe he gets into the Champions League this time, man. Marcel Sabitzer in that midfield, always been really reliable. And then at the back, you although a little bit old, you have a veteran in Mats Hummels who stepped up big time in that matchup against PSV. Dorman will be a tough test. And oh, I know no. you don't deny that. I no, know you I don't, don't deny that. But no, I want to. I want people to be aware of that. That Dorman yeah. is not... I know a lot of people were looking at them as potentially the most favorable matchup. And it is isn't. It is like on paper. But I think that they still prove to be a really tough test, especially for this Atletico Madrid side who you already went through. And I'm not even going to touch on because yeah. you did that. you did that perfectly. The reason why I see Atletico Madrid going through here is the coaching factor. Diego Simeone, I think, is on a incredible run right now yeah. and is just so, so tough to beat in a knockout setting in the Champions League. But then also the fact that Dorman, to me, really disappointed in their matchup against PSV. And I know that sounds crazy because they won 3-1 on aggregate. And, you know, if you look at, like, the highlights of the games, it looks like they were actually pretty dominant. They generated, like, 15 shots on goal. In, in their last game against PSV at home. But to counter that, PSV generates 17, bro. Yeah. 17 opportunities on this Dortmund side that were, in my opinion, really clear and weren't finished because PSV has some awful finishers on their team. Shout out to my boy Chucky Lozano. We've seen it for a decade. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but beyond that, it's the fact that PSV was able to impose themselves upon this Dortmund side, especially when they were down 2-1. I saw a lot of open gaps. I saw a lot of open spaces oh, yeah, that yeah, PSV yeah. just couldn't fully expose, but that were there for a better team to take advantage of. I think Atletico is that better team. I think they are. I think despite maybe how lack of fluidity they might be in terms of the full 11, they have a lot of good individual talent. Griezmann is one of the best players in the world when he's on it. Yep. Morata although often criticized, can be a clinical finisher and can step up in important moments. Yep. And then all the players around them, the midfield, the Paul, Llorente, these are good players, man. Whereas for Dortmund, I think there's a level, there's a limit on what they can achieve. I have Atletico going through. Not super convincingly. I think it's going to be very tight. It's going to be very gritty. It's going to be very physical. But Atleti will go through. And maybe I join you at the Wanda for that semifinal hey, appearance, my that. friend. I would love that. And yes, just to make it very clear, I have Atletico winning this matchup pretty much for the same reasons that you said about Dortmund. I think they've, if Bayern Munich has been inconsistent in the Bundesliga, Dortmund's been twice as inconsistent. I think that will definitely show once or twice, maybe 10 times, in 180 minutes of football against Atletico Madrid. I just think it's going to be very tight simply because if Terzic can set up Dortmund right, Atletico are beatable. But again, for the same reasons that you just put out, I think Simeone, I trust him. Trust them fully. The way, we against, the way we played against Inter Milan was remarkable. We've seen it for over 10 years. It's what Simeone does. We have a lot of players in form. When they show up, when they show up, we can play almost against anybody. Almost. And I feel good about that against Dortmund because Dortmund are not a top, top side. We show up, we win. I think it's guaranteed if that happens. You mentioned that you'll go to the Wanda if Atletico wins this matchup as a reward. I will counter that by imposing myself this punishment if Dortmund ends up going through because if you look back on all of our predictions for this year, <laughs> yeah. Dortmund in the group of death, I had them going out, they go through. Same. Dortmund against PSV, I had them going out, they go through. Dortmund in the quarterfinals, defeating Atletico yeah. and going through to the semis, that deserves an apology letter from Reynoso. Mm. I'll write a five-page letter apology. I'll read it here on this podcast and I'll submit the photos online into a database where you can read the letters every single time whenever you want. We'll send it to Dortmund. And we'll send it to Dortmund. We'll put it in their mailbox. And we'll do something. But I do think that is rightfully what a Dortmund fan deserves because yeah, I have spoken man. badly about them this entire season after the heartbreak they went through last year. And they have proven me wrong so far. And now here they are against Atletico Madrid in a quarterfinal matchup. There's a chance they go through, bro. And they find themselves yeah. in a semifinal Champions League appearance. I'll give them their credit. Dortmund in the semifinals, I will write that apology letter. I promise. Doesn't that sound crazy, though? It sounds crazy to me, Dortmund though, man. Dortmund like, in the semifinals. It's great. Like, this, this Dortmund team, yeah. this year in the semis, it's right. nuts. It's nuts, man. Last year, definitely could... I honestly could have seen it. They played good football when they were at their peak, but this year, it's just been so inconsistent for them to make a semi... Be a top-four side in Europe. <laughs> yeah, and the way think. the bracket's set up, 
they could be in the oh, final afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. They could be in the final At that afterwards. point, I mean, Dorman could do anything, bro. Yes. And that just had to be absolutely nuts. For those who might not know, the way the bracket is set up is Arsenal and Bayern, Real Madrid and Manchester City are on one side of the bracket. Atletico and Dortmund and PSG Barcelona are on the other. And it's fixed. Those are the matches that are going to be facing off against each other. If Atletico wins and Barca wins, it's Atletico Barca in the semifinal. If Madrid and Arsenal win, it's Madrid Arsenal. There is no switching up anymore like it was in the round of 16. And so this side of the bracket for Atletico is a much more manageable side, in my opinion, versus having Arsenal, Real Madrid, Man City, Bayern all on one side. That to me sounds really, really deadly. It's a little bit more open here on the, this other side of the bracket. And to finish off the bracket, the last match we have to speak about is PSG, Paris Saint-Germain, mm. facing off against Barcelona. Spain versus <laughs> France here. Two teams that have gone through a very interesting season, man. PSG leading Ligue 1 at the moment, destined to lift the trophy once again, whereas Barcelona, I think, is currently in second place, but has had a, a lot of ups and downs mm. this season with Xavi himself announcing that he will leave the team at the end of the season. The first game of this matchup is slated to be played at the Parc de Princes, and the second game will be at the Camp Nou. Luis Enrique guiding this PSG against his former yeah, club, yeah. and Xavi going up against Luis Enrique, his Spanish teammate at one point, I believe. So this is a pretty crazy matchup just in terms of the storylines, in terms of the narratives, the the setting, the, the spectacle that we are going to see, and ultimately, the presence of one man, and one man only, the destined star boy for Real Madrid, Barcelona's rival, Kylian Mbappé, will be playing in this matchup, my friend. And I think that's going to be a very, very big factor when it comes to facing off against <clears throat> this Barcelona side. I'm going to go straight to the outcome here, the conclusion. I think Mbappé is going to be the difference. I look at these two sides, that bright, bright star that's on that left <laughs> wing side, or sometimes in the center, it's just too, it's too bright to ignore. Yeah. And... I'll get to the Barcelona analysis. I'll even get to the rest of PSG, but I mean, Mbappe's a monster. And even with all the external factors and drama that has been going on for this season and last season, him having pictures, you know, leaving the field, going up to the bench yeah. with his mom, like all this stuff, is he going to go to Real Madrid? He still has 27 goals and 27 appearances for PSG this season. You see season. that hat trick? It's, yeah. That I, hat I, trick was crazy this past weekend. Crazy, man. bro. Lord. He's a monster. He's a machine. The deadliest striker in European football. I mean, it, there's just no question about it. Mbappe is going to get his moments. And that, that, that's the thing. With all these external things going on, he's still a killer machine. Imagine if he locks in one night in France against Barcelona. Imagine if he just locks in. And what's crazy is I'm not even knocking this Barcelona side. Because when you look at this team, there is a lot of grit, personality, aggression, and top, top quality. I mean, you look at their back line, I don't think they're going to really struggle against this PSG offensive line. There's some really good talent, even outside of Mbappe, but Jules Koundé is going to have a really tough task to face Mbappe. Here's the thing. I, I honestly think Koundé is one of the best defensive right backs in the world. I trust him to handle Kylian Mbappe. And then on the left-hand side of Joao Cancelo's back, I mean, you have one of the best passing left backs in the world. And then Pau Cubarsi has slotted in to this Barcelona back line like he's been there for five fucking years <laughs> alongside Ronnie Araujo. Yeah. They're fine defensively. I trust Barcelona, yeah. honestly. Let's go up to the top for them to score against this PSG side because they definitely will, man. Rafinha has been, he's been good. He could be a little bit better, but he'll always create havoc on that right wing side. And then you still have players like Lamine Yamal who can come off the bench or low-key start. The amount of dribble penetration and chaos that he's going to create, it's going to be a nightmare for PSG. On the other side, you have players like Joao Felix who's so cheeky, so tricky. And Lewandowski has honestly been immense this year yeah, for Barcelona. Better now. He had a really quiet start from like September to yeah, December, but yeah. my goodness, this calendar year, Lewandowski has popped the fuck off, man. Yeah. Two assists, one goal against Atletico this past weekend. Each Sheesh. moment was sheer brilliance, Sheesh. bro. Yeah, bro, yeah. Sheer brilliance. Lewandowski, he may not have the same physicality that he once had at his peak or his prime, but it's all still there. He has one of the highest IQs in Europe. His execution is still fantastic. You give him a chance in the box, whether it's in front of goal or off the pass, Lewandowski is going to put it away. So Barcelona have a really good offense, a very good offense. I do think, though, they're going to need De Jong. 
They're going to need De Jong in the midfield. Yeah, yeah. If you don't have De Jong, all you'll have is Gundogan, which is amazing. You're going to need Gundogan for sure. No Gundogan, no party for Barcelona. Mm-mm, mm-mm. So you need Gundogan, but you need another class midfielder alongside him. Fermin's been good. Sergio Roberto has been good. But, you know, against you know just weaker sides. Against a team like PSG, you want to dominate that midfield. I think you can if you have Frankie back. And you obviously, Gundogan is, you know, operating in the midfield. So I, I basically just said Barcelona are going to win this whole fucking thing. Shh, that's the, the thing. The difference is Mbappe. That's yeah. the difference. And I think it's a big difference because if you look at the PSG side, without Mbappe, I don't think it's that impressive of a squad. No, it's not. Whereas for Barcelona, you just made some great points, man. Like, and, and to add on to that, I think the reason for why I agree that they have a lot of grit is because of the injuries that they've gone through this right. year. No Pedri, no Gavi. The young has now been out for a while. Mm. And they just find a way to stay consistent, to stay getting results, especially against top teams, not named Real Madrid, essentially. Like, they still know how to play against the top teams in the world, despite starting a 17-year-old center back and a 16-year-old winger yeah. up top, man. It's ridiculous, like, how they've been able to do that. And I do give credit to Xavi. I give credit to the entire club because when they won their round of 16 matchup, I said I said this on the show last week that I'm actually really impressed mm. with, Bar- with what Barcelona has done so far given the circumstances that they've faced leading up to this point in the season so all credit to the man and I'm coming from a really positive place my <laughs> heart goes to Barcelona it's just a damn shame that on the other side of the pitch is in my opinion the best player in the world right now I think that's what he's capable of exactly. and Mbappe is pursuing his first Champions League trophy in what is going to be his final year at PSG I think he's going to leave it all out on the pitch, man. And I don't think he's going to be forgiving this time around, especially with the fact, with the narrative, this is soon going to be his rival team once he's at Real Madrid, man. It's yeah. actually kind of scary, and I'd be worried to... I'd be having nightmares of Mbappe if I was a Barca fan because of the things that he might do to y'all. But yes, PSG as a whole, I criticized them at the beginning of the year because they started such a young midfield, man, with guys like Vitinha, who's only like 22 years old, yeah, and young. Zaire Emery. They're very good, but the responsibility that Enrique puts on them, I mean, they're the midfielders for them now, yep. whereas you don't have a, a Gundogan-type level player. You don't right, have a exactly. Frenkie de Jong who is older than both of them yep. on that in that midfield, man, to, to service Mbappe and to be able to handle the pressure of top midfields of other clubs. They've been great so far, but I do think that's going to expose itself a little bit in this matchup. Defensively, I do think PSG is good with Hakimi in that wingback position. Yeah. Lucas Hernandez has been great as a center back. Yeah. They've been playing the 20-year-old Bar- Brazilian uh, Beraldo a lot. He's been getting a lot of minutes. And then uh, Donnarumma at the back, who's one of the best goalkeepers in the world. Up front, Kylian Mbappé paired up with Colomuani, who's also been having a really solid season so far mm-hmm. after his great year at Frankfurt. And then you have the surprise factor of a guy like King and Lee. If he comes off the bench or he starts, he's always looking to assist. He's He's always looking to feed his star boy in Kylian Mbappe. There's some interesting factors to this PSG team. I think they're lesser than Barcelona, but I think Kylian Mbappe puts them over the top. Exactly. And I think if Barcelona has started playing the way they've been playing this last month, like four months ago, I actually might say Barcelona, but it's been a little sh- bit too short-lived as far as Barcelona's success is concerned, right? I mean, they just got into second place, but that shows you the trajectory that they're on, right? They build this core, this style of play that they have going on right now. I could see Barcelona being very deadly in the next like six to eight months, and especially if everybody's healthy. Like Barcelona have a really good young core alongside very talented prime or veteran players. It's fantastic for Barcelona. I just think they're a little too early along their progression right now. And when you're playing against the difference maker like Mbappe, that's why I'm going PSG. But I mean, as you said, I want to just add in a little bit too for PSG. There are players who are going to give Barcelona problems, right? You already said Colomuani. If Dembele's back, I'm not sure if he's going to make it. I'm not that he's a great finisher, but I mean, he's going to create so much havoc against Barcelona. And that's another thing is Barcelona is not necessarily used to this type of offense, uh, an offense that has three-pronged attack. They can attack from any angle that they wish to. I just think it's going to be a little bit tough for Barcelona to really handle. That's why they'll need De Jong, someone who can relieve pressure in possession. They don't have it. They're definitely not winning. But I think if he does play, they'll have a fighter's chance for sure. And then Bradley Barcola, 18-year-old, mm-hmm. I believe, mm-hmm. has been actually pretty decent this season too. You already mentioned Lee kang providing really good generation off of the bench. Ugarte, if you need a little bit of a defensive presence in the midfield. So, I mean, this PSG side is deep 
when it comes to who can play at a very, very high level. And you add all of that together, plus the difference maker in Mbappe, I think they can beat this young Barcelona team. Is it an is it a limited analysis though to just say that Mbappe is going to be a difference maker in the sense that what if he gets what if he gets frozen out this game right, then right. what yeah that'd be crazy yeah I just haven't seen it happen in uh, like really really <laughs> big big matches That's true. That's like where true. he just gets comp- like if PSG do lose I would f- think that it would be because the rest of his teammates let him down you already said it it's a very inexperienced midfield for PSG I mean they used to have a star studded midfield. What's weird is that there might be more balance now because there's almost no ego in the midfield, mm-hmm. but they're very inexperienced. And low-key, I, again, we've already said it, Barcelona have a better midfield. Defensively, they're great. I would say they line up perfectly against Barcelona. So then it has to come down to Mbappe being the difference. If that's not the difference, then somebody fucked up in the PSG <laughs> midfield or in defense. Well, that's what I'm going to put it on. It's on like the water boy, like the fucking <laughs> assistant coach. Like he got something wrong, man, that affected the whole lineup to Kylian Mbappe. Yeah, and just to be very clear, because I don't know what people are going to think, but I'm not saying this is going to be a clear-cut win for PSG. I think it's actually going to be pretty tight. We already gave the reasons why Barcelona are going to make it tight. I just think Mbappe is going to going to be the difference. I can't stress that enough. But other than that, other than Mbappe, this is honestly a really even matchup. How close is the gap between Mbappe and Holland? Is it bigger than people think? I've been seeing a lot of tweets about mm. it's killing Mbappe. It's killing Mbappe right now, and there's a big gap between that and the second best player in the world. When you truly think about it, because when it comes to this debate about Erling Holland and killing Mbappe, yeah. I've always been Team Mbappe. Because I think his overall impact is much greater than Holland, and Holland's now seen himself have a string of games where you know he goes a little silent yeah. despite scoring a lot of goals. Is there a clear big gap there, or is it actually pretty tight? I just always the first thing I think of when I think Mbappe and Holland is a style difference, and when I just look at the way that they play, obviously, objectively, Mbappe can do more with the ball. Right, so you consider that. You also consider how many goals he scores. Uh, you just, I think you have to give it to Mbappe by a gap, too, by a gap. Right, Holland's one of the best finishers in the world, but I just think Mbappe can do a lot more too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> I think I agree with you yeah. there, man. And there you have it. Those are the four quarterfinal matchups in this star-studded Champions League. I cannot wait. I am full of excitement. And we will be there to react to the results of the first leg and speak about them when they do happen. But until then, folks, I would like to know, as well as Saltero, what you guys predict will happen in these games. Do you agree? Do you disagree with our analysis? And if you're a fan of one of these teams, then please let us know because I I really want to see if we have Dortmund fans following us, if we have other Atleti fans that support Saltero through his crisis this season. Let us know in the comments down below, guys, and we will see you folks very, very soon. Till next time, peace.